The scriptures tell us of the importance of studying God's Word. The psalmist writes, Thy word is a lamp unto thy feet and a light unto thy path. In another place, he continues, How can a young man keep his way pure? By keeping it according to thy word. We at Calvary Chapel Worship Center believe in teaching through the Bible in its entirety. May your faith be increased at the hearing of God's word. Here now is Pastor Rich. So thankful as we now, as we now open our scriptures to receive, I pray that you just pour out the spirit of life. Lord, we want to have more than just knowledge. We want to have love. For Lord, we know that love builds up, love edifies, love changes. We want to have your love poured out to us, Lord, as we understand more of who you are and your heart for us. We pray that now in Jesus' name. Amen. So the, Israel, the, the, the people of Israel had asked for a king, and so God gave them a man after their heart, a man whom they could look up to, literally, because Saul was head and shoulders taller than them all, very good-looking fellow, and uh, he was anointed king. Now, what's interesting, as you studied Saul, is that uh, at first in our study of his kingship uh, reign, we discovered the, the wonderful qualities that he had at the first. Because God gave him everything he needed to rule and to reign well. He was given the Holy Spirit. And uh, he was given every opportunity for life and godliness. But he must make the choice to stay on that path of good, of right, of godliness. And so at the beginning of his, of his uh, reign we really discovered some of those leadership things that he did that we would say, in fact, the people of Israel said, this is really great. We're so glad we have a king. We're so glad we made that choice. Aren't we smart? Aren't we wonderful because we asked God for a king? But then they began to see the cracks in his character. And they began to see those things increase mightily. And they began to see maybe it wasn't such a good thing after all that they had a king. For they had rejected God as their king in choosing to ask God for a king. And so here it comes, as we begin then to discover those cracks in his character, we got to chapter 14, and his son Jonathan, as they were battling the Philistines, uh, they were really in a dire place. In fact, the, the people of Israel, the men, uh, this is near Michmash. They were hiding in rocks. There was confusion. Uh, there were not many men. There was desertion. It really wasn't looking good at all. And then Jonathan, his son, really in a demonstration of faith. And, and, and one of my favorite stories in the Bible is when Jonathan made a decision to trust God in an awesome venture of faith. When he said uh, to his, his armor bearer, his assistant alongside of him, Let's see, who knows God may be in this? And he said, you know, God can save whether by many or by few. It makes no difference to God. Now, right there, I love that. I love the faith. I love the courage to stand in faith. God doesn't need many. God can save by many or by few. Who knows? Let's see if God is in it. And he said, now, if, they, if uh, we go down to the garrison, and uh, we'll go down there, and the men will be up there on this cliff. And uh, we'll, they'll see us. We'll expose her. They'll see us. And uh, so if they say, we're going to come down to you, then we know, hey, I don't think God's in this. But if they say, you come up here, we'll show you a few things, we'll know that God is in this thing. So they go down there, and, uh, and they see the, the men. And so uh, they say to Jonathan, hey, you guys come up here, we'll show you a few things. So Jonathan immediately said, hey, God is in this thing. I mean, he was scrambling up that hill, hand and over foot. He was running up that hill. He was running straight into a group of soldiers, just him and his, you know, his assistant, his armor bearer. And, and Jonathan got to the top of the hill, and he just started plowing through guys. I mean, he just started knocking them down. And his armor bearer, and they're all confused. What in the world's going on? And Jonathan is knocking him down. The armor bearer is finishing him off. He's got 20 guys down before they can hardly even understand what's happening. The whole camp is in confusion. They start to run away. And so Saul sees the whole thing, and he says, number, quickly, who's missing? You know? And they say, uh, they count them all up. 
Jonathan, his armor bearer. And uh, so he's like, oh, this is amazing. And he puts everybody into pursuit. And so now they're after the Philistines. The whole thing is turned on his head. And they're pursuing the Philistines with everything. And there is where Saul's leadership now is in trouble. Because he makes this really foolish statement. And he says, nobody can eat anything until we have had victory over our enemies. What kind of... What, John, Saul, these guys got to eat. What are you doing? Some, you know, he's making some bold declaration. I, I too can do something bold and bodacious. You think Jonathan is the... I can do something bold. Saul, what are you doing? These men got to eat. And then he said, if anyone eats anything, he's going to be put to death. What a, what, Saul. And so they're pursuing, the, now Jonathan wasn't there when he, when he made this declaration, and so Jonathan is pursuing too, you know, and they come upon some honeycomb. And so Jonathan dips his spear into the honey, and this is a good way to do it, don't put your hand in there, and he puts his spear in there, you know, and pulls the honey out, and as soon as he eats some honey, woo, he's bright, you know, wow, you know. And, uh, and so uh, they, hey, did you know that Saul made this rule today, that was not a good thing to do. See how my eyes brightened? The energy has come into me. That, that wasn't a good thing. Well, so they go, to, to make a long story short, what happened was they, they come and really don't have the victory. And so they ask of the, I mean, they get victory, but not like it could have been. And so the next day they ask of the Lord, but they don't receive an answer. So Saul immediately realized there's something wrong. And so someone has gone against the band. He recognized right away. And, uh, and the men were so hungry. They were famished. They were eating animals with blood in it. and they were, it was, it was, That was wrong. And so they did this lottery thing. And they come to find out that Jonathan was the one. And so he said, Jonathan, you're going to die. Now, Jonathan was willing. I mean, he's, he's such a servant, you know, he's willing to do what his dad asks. But the people rise up and they say, no way. This man has fought with God. No way. And they saved him from Saul. And you realize, here's the problem. The people have got to stop the leader from making a bad decision. Now, that's not the way it's supposed to be. The leader is supposed to be leading in good and godly direction. And a leader that's leading in good and godly things knows that he's got to please God in what he does. And none of this was pleasing the Lord. And so then it says, as we get to chapter 47, now when Saul, or chapter 14, verse 47, now when Saul had taken the kingdom over Israel, he fought against all his enemies. Kind of summarizes here some of his, his rulership. Against Moab, the sons of Ammon, Eden, Edom, the kings of Zobah, Philistines, wherever he turned, he inflicted punishment. He acted valiantly, defeated the Amalekites. This is a summary here. Delivered Israel from the hands of those who plundered them. Now the sons of Saul were these, Jonathan, Ishvi, Malkishua, and the names of his two daughters were these, the firstborn, Merab, the name of the younger one, Michel, or Michal. And uh, the name of Saul's wife was Ahinoam, the daughter of Ahamaz. And the name of the captain of his army was Abner. We'll hear more from him. The son of Ner, Saul's uncle. Kish was the father of Saul, and Ner, the father of Abner, was the son of Abiel. Now, the war against the Philistines was severe all the days of Saul, and when Saul saw any mighty man or any valiant man, he would attach him to his staff, chapter 15. Now, Samuel said to Saul, the Lord sent me to anoint you as king over his people, over Israel. Now, therefore, listen to the words of the Lord. Thus says the Lord of hosts, I will punish Amalek for what he did to Israel how he set himself against him on the way while he was coming up from Egypt. Now, go and strike Amalek and utterly destroy all that he has. Do not spare him, but put to death both man and woman, and child and infant, ox and sheep, camel and donkey. So, th this is a kind of an interesting story. Really, Saul has an opportunity here 
to, you could say, redeem himself, to be obedient, whereas he has been disobedient in the past. We read about it. And so here it comes to the story of the Amalekites. Now, Amalek, if you remember, goes, this goes way back. This goes back to the history of Israel when they came up out of Egypt. And here they cross the Red Sea, they go into the desert, and they start to make their way to the Promised Land. Perhaps you remember the story that the, the sons of Amalek, the Amalekites, they came and they attacked Israel in an unprovoked attack. But what they did was quite wrong. It was very despicable. They, instead of doing a frontal attack against the army, you could say the men on arms, they circled around the back and they started to attack at the weak point. And so here in the back would be the women with children, the elderly, women who are pregnant. And so they go around to the back and this is where they attack. This is, this is really despicable. And so the, the Amalek people, uh, God says of them, when you enter into the Holy Land, this must be settled. Because the Amalek people were, if you knew their story, do some interesting research on them sometime. The, the things that they were doing is just, just breaks your heart. And it's just sickening to the stomach when you realize the sacrifice that they were doing. They were sacrificing their children, for example. And it's like, ah, oh, this is just so wrong. And he says, the sin of Amalek has come to the fullness. So he says, this matter is going to be settled, and he asked Saul to do it. So Saul summoned the people and numbered them in Telaim, 200,000 foot soldiers, 10,000 men of Judah, verse 5. Saul came to the city of Amalek, and he set an ambush in the valley. So Saul said to the Kenites, go, and uh, the Kenites were living up there. Uh, Moses was a descendant of the Kenites, or his father-in-law was. And so he said, go and depart, go down from among the Amalekites, lest I destroy you with them. For you showed kindness to all the sons of Israel when they come up out of Egypt. So the Kenites did that. They departed. And they left from the Amalekites. So Saul then defeated the Amalekites from Havilah as you go to Shur, which is east of Egypt. In other words, very south uh, in, Egypt, in Israel. And, but it says he captured Agag, the king of the Amalekites, alive and utterly destroyed all the people with the edge of the sword. But Saul and the people spared Agag and the best of the sheep, the best of the oxen, the best of the, the fatlings, the lambs. All that was good. Now, was that what God asked them to do? Not at all. So what it says here is that they were not willing to destroy them utterly. Not really willing to obey. I, there was some good stuff there. Look at there's good lambs, there's good, you know, there's some good things. Who, who, who worries? You know, it's not a big deal. It's not really a big deal. And so, why not? You know, it's, those lambs are good. It's not, is that a big deal? It's not a big deal. So let's do it. You know, they're good lambs and stuff. And, but he said, everything despised and worthless. Well, we didn't want that anyway. What do you get out of this picture? Disobedience. The heart's not right here. And what you have to understand is, you, and you're going to see this later, it's no big deal. It's, it's, it's no big deal. A disobedience is no big deal. It's, it's no big deal. You know what that is? That's a lie. But he was convincing himself of it. And it's going to hurt. It's going to hurt bad. Let's continue. Verse 10. Then the word of the Lord came to Samuel saying, I regret that I made Saul king. Which is to say, there's sorrow in me. I, I have sorrow that I made Saul king. For he has turned back from following me. And he has not carried out my commands. And Samuel was distressed and cried to the Lord all night. I love Samuel's heart. But I think it's an interesting question. For many people have asked, well, didn't God know? Didn't God know? Well, surely he did know. God gave them a man after their heart, and God surely did know. But in the same breath, we have to say, but God also knew us. God knew that we would sin, and yet here we are. God still loves us. God does know. God knew that Adam would sin. God knew that Eve would sin. But God also knew that he would pay the redemption of his blood 
to redeem and love them back. And it's therefore God's glory that is revealed in it all. Samuel then rose up early in the morning to meet Saul. And it was told to Samuel saying, Saul came to Carmel and behold, he set up a monument for himself. <laughs> a monument for himself. He's like giving himself an award here. And then he turned and proceeded on down to Gilgal. I mean, you know, it's one thing when someone gives you an award. But when you make your own award, now that's a whole nother thing. Amen. You know, there's a whole business. Did you know there's a whole business in making people feel good about themselves? Of course, there's a lot of businesses like that. But have you ever, have you ever got one of these who's who in America uh, things, announcements? Have you ever got one of those? Uh, okay, there you go. Thank you for your help. And so what is interesting is that the who's who in America is actually a, a, a way of feeding your ego in order to create a business, right? I actually got a, when I was in high school, like a who's who in the high school. And I thought, oh, this is cool. Oh, I've got to get the book. I've got to get the who's who in America book, you know. And so that I can, I guess I can open that up when my friends come. And say, Do you know who's who in America? Look under the J's, you'll find my name right there, you know. Well, then, so years later, right, I'm pastoring, I'm pastoring the church, and I get a who's who letter, you know, who's who in America, uh, you know, we want to list you in the who's who of American pastors. And they sent me a plaque. <laughs> and of course they said, if you want to buy the book, to go along with the plaque, you can have the who's who book and the plaque for only forty nine ninety five. <laughs> and if you order today, they'll send you Ginzu knives. And I looked at that plaque, and I thought, what in the world am I going to do with this plaque? Am I going to hang that on my wall? Come into my office and see who's who in America. <laughs> I mean, come on. This is just, it's just not right. Amen? And so when you make your own monument, that's like printing your own who's who. There's something wrong here. So he makes his own monument. Okay? Then it says he goes down to Gilgo. Now, Verse 13, Samuel is going after him. He's going to find him. So Samuel came to Saul, and Saul said to him, I love this greeting, Blessed are you of the Lord. He's got the religious talk going on right away. Okay, that's a front. This is a front, because he knows he's, got, he's not done the right thing, and he knows that he's in trouble. He knows he's going to be confronted. Blessed are you of the Lord. I have carried out the command of the Lord. <laughs> to me, this is like he's defensive right away. Samuel said, oh yeah? Well then what then is the bleeding of these sheep that I hear in my ears? What is the lowing of the oxen which I hear? I mean, here's Samuel. I mean, here's Saul, excuse me. I have carried out the command of the Lord. And then you can hear, meh, 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 meh. You know, I have carried out the command of the Lord. Oh yeah? Well, what's this I hear in my ears? And so this, he's caught, right? So Saul said, they, oh, they did it. They brought them from the Amalekites, for the people spared the best of the sheep and the oxen to sacrifice to the Lord your God. But the rest of the sacrifice, we utterly, uh, for the rest of the things, we utterly destroyed them. But we saved the best. You know why we saved the best? We did it for the purpose of sacrifice. Now, this is an excuse. He's making an excuse. If you're going to make an excuse, the trick to making an excuse is that it's got to be good. I mean, it has to sound good to the person who's listening to it. Sacrifice, that, that, that sounds good. So, but it's still an excuse. Whether it's good or not good, it's still an excuse. And so I think it really is an important thing for our own spiritual lives to understand that excuses do not help us spiritually to be victorious. And I think that in order to be spiritually growing in maturity, we don't want excuses in our lives. We want spiritual reality. We want to do what God is asking us to do. We want to stand where God is asking us to stand. No excuses. Well, 
Samuel said to Saul, wait just a moment. Let me tell you what the Lord said to me last night. And he said, speak. Samuel said, is it not true, though you were little in your own eyes, that you were made head of the tribes of Israel, and the Lord anointed you king over Israel? And the Lord sent you on a mission, and he said, go and utterly destroy the sinners, the Amalekites, fight against them till they're exterminated. Why then did you not obey the voice of the Lord, but you rushed upon the spoil? You did what was evil in the sight of the Lord. And Saul said to Samuel, I did. I did obey the voice of the Lord. I went on the mission on which the Lord sent me. Then I brought back Agag, the king of, the, of Amalek, and I've destroyed the Amalekites. But the people, they did it. They, they took some of the spoil, sheep and the oxen, choices of the things, devoted to destruction, in order to sacrifice to the Lord your God at Gilgal. So now he's passing blame. First, he tries to make an excuse. Now he's passing blame. It's their fault. They did it. So here again, passing blame is not growing spiritually. Neither do we make excuses. Neither do we pass blame. No, do not blame anyone else. We take spiritual responsibility for what God is wanting in our lives. And we don't blame anybody else. Amen? Can't blame your wife. Can't blame your husband. You know, if my, if my wife wasn't such a difficult person, I could be more spiritually uh, attuned. I could be more spiritually appraised if it wasn't for my wife. That's not going to work with the Lord. For if you stand before the holy throne of God and try that, that blame shift, God's going to say, no, I asked you. I asked you to love me with all your heart. Regardless of whether your wife is this or your husband is difficult or your children or, or your job or anything. No excuses and no blame shifting. Amen? So Saul then hears this from Samuel. Has the Lord as much delight in burnt offerings and sacrifices as in obeying the voice of the Lord? Behold, to obey is better than sacrifice. There is a great spiritual key. To obey is better than sacrifice, and to heed or to listen is better than the fat of rams. Why is that true? Because sacrifice is a representation of something much deeper. The sacrifice is a picture of something else. Obedience should be what your heart really is. And so one is your real heart and the other is just a picture. And so he says, obedience is better than sacrifice. To listen is better than the fat of rams. Notice verse 23, for rebellion is as the sin of divination. And insubordination is as the iniquity and idolatry. Now you say, whoa, that, now we got serious here. Rebellion is as the sin of divination? You see, this is an important thing that Samuel is saying to him. Because really what Saul was saying, is no big deal. Okay, got some lambs. and some, what, What's the big deal? We did it for the sacrifice. And so what Samuel is saying to him is, it is a big deal. It is. Listening to the Lord is a big deal because that's your heart. That's the reality of where your heart is. It is a big deal. And so he says, because you've rejected the word of the Lord, he's rejected you from being king. So Saul said to Samuel, I've sinned. I have indeed transgressed the command of the Lord and your words, because I feared the people and I listened to their voice. I feared the people and I listened to their voice. That doesn't work either, does it? He's blaming the people here. And, but here's really the issue. He is the one who has authority. And if you have authority, you have responsibility. You can't blame the ones that you are, you know, over. You can't say, well, uh, you know, my kids made me do it. No, you're the parent. You're the parent. You can't say, well, my kids made me do it. You're responsible. And so the same thing, you see, it doesn't work. And so therefore, in verse 25, please pardon my sin and return with me that I may worship the Lord. 
And Samuel said to Saul, I, No, I'm not going to return with you. For you have rejected the word of the Lord, and the Lord has rejected you from being king over Israel. And Samuel turned to go, but Saul seized the edge of his robe and tore it. Man, he really grabbed him. So Samuel said to him, The Lord has torn the kingdom of Israel from you today and has given it to your neighbor who is better than you, which is to say David. And also the glory of Israel will not lie or change his mind, for he is not a man that he should change his mind. Then he said, I have sinned, but now this is interesting. I have sinned, but please honor me now before the elders of my people and before Israel and go back with me that I may worship the Lord your God. Do you get what he just said? I have sinned, but would you go back with me so that it looks good? Isn't that what he just said? It, I, it, it, can you just make me look good in the eyes of the elders? But Samuel did go back following Saul, and Saul worshipped the Lord. And then Samuel said, bring me Agag, the king of the Amalekites. And Agag came to him cheerfully. And Agag said, surely the bitterness of death is past. He didn't know what was going to happen. Samuel said, as your sword has made women childless, so shall your mother be childless among women. And Samuel hewed Agag to pieces before the Lord at Gilgal. Then Samuel went to Ramah, but Samuel went up to his house at Gibeah of Saul. And Samuel did not see Saul again until the day of his death. For Samuel grieved over Saul, and the Lord regretted or was sad, grieved that he made Saul king over Israel. Chapter 16. Now the Lord said to Samuel, How long will you grieve over Saul since I have rejected him from being king over Israel? Fill your horn with oil and go. I will send you to Jesse the Bethlehemite. For I have selected a king for myself among his sons. But Samuel said, how can I go? When Saul hears of it, he's going to kill me. Now that's a statement there. And the Lord said, take a heifer with you and say, I've come to sacrifice to the Lord. And you shall invite Jesse to the sacrifice. And I will show you what you shall do. And you shall anoint for me the one whom I designate to you. So Samuel did what the Lord said and came to Bethlehem. And the elders of the city came trembling to meet him and said, do you come in peace? And he said, in peace. I have come to sacrifice to the Lord. Consecrate yourselves and come with me to the sacrifice. He also consecrated Jesse and his sons and invited them to the sacrifice. Then it came about when he entered that he looked at Eliab, the, that's Jesse's oldest boy, and thought, surely the Lord's anointed is before him. He looked at him. Thought, this is the one. He's the oldest boy. Surely he's the one. Verse 7. But the Lord said to Samuel, Do not look at his appearance or at the height of his stature, because I have rejected him. I've rejected this one. For God sees not as man sees. Now, I have verse 7 highlighted and underlined, because this is a really important verse. It gives us really a great understanding of who God is and a helpful understanding of how he sees us. It tells us here, for man looks at the outward appearance, but the Lord looks at the heart. Now, some people may be rather afraid of that, but frankly, I think it's a very good thing. Man looks at the outward, but God looks at the heart. I was mentioning this on, on, on the weekend services. Isn't that a truth? You know how we are. We like to uh, honor people that we think are impressive. You know, if somebody has wealth, then, you know, oh, wow, you know, and we, we like to talk about him or her, and wow, you know, we're, we, we like to do favoritism. In fact, the book of James talks about that. And he says, not in the church. Do not have favoritism. You know how people are amongst men. He said, not so among you. And he says, I know how it is. This is the Lord speaking through, the, through James. And he says, I know how it is. You know, if somebody special comes, you say, oh, come, sit up here in this special place. But if somebody with rags or poor, you can see that he's poor, he says, oh, you, know, you sit back over there. And he said, no, this should not ought to be. Don't have favoritism, for God is no respecter of persons. 
I've always loved that statement. God is no respecter of persons. Do you know what that means? It doesn't mean he doesn't respect people. What it means is that he doesn't see man as we see. Man looks at the outward appearance. God looks at the heart. God is not impressed. If man has a lot of money, God is not impressed because it's nothing to him. How much gold do you have? Well, isn't that amazing? We pave the streets with it in heaven. God's not impressed. How much power do you think you have? God has infinite power. God's not impressed. And so really what the Scripture tells us is that God dwells with the contrite of heart, the one who is humble in spirit, the one who loves God is the one that God honors. For God blesses the one who loves Him. You know, that's what God wants. That's what God is looking for. More than anything else, that's what God wants. It's for us to love Him with all of our heart. One of the best illustrations I can think of, I mentioned this on Sunday, it's so worth repeating, that we are so impressed when people have degrees and education, and you can today get a doctorate in theology. You know, I thought long and hard about that. Wouldn't it be amazing to have a doctorate in theology? You know what a doctorate in theology means? That means that you have studied God for at least eight years at the collegiate level and beyond, and they have, you know, given you this degree so that you are called a doctor of theology in the study of God. And many people are very impressed with that. Wow, you are a doctor. You have a doctorate in theology. But one of the things I think we need to understand is that it means absolutely nothing to have a doctorate of theology unless you are flat out, sold out in love with Jesus Christ. What good is any degree going to do you if you don't love Jesus Christ with all of your heart? And that's what God is looking for. That's what God wants from our church. You know, we're, it's so wonderful to have a building. It's so wonderful to have a building that's, you know, it's, we're updating it and we're decorating it. We're doing new things. We're going to have our own baptistry. And, you know, we, we, this is wonderful things. But what good would it do? What good would it do if we didn't love God with all of our heart as a church? What good would it do? We could have a cathedral that was, you know, just glorious in splendor and majesty. And people would stand in awe of it. I mean, they would drive by and buy tickets to see it. Come and drive by because it's so amazing in grandeur. What good would it do? What good would it be? If we don't love the Lord Jesus Christ with all of our heart, soul, mind, and strength, that's what God wants in our church. And that's what we must be. Would anybody agree with me on this? That's what we must be. We must be in love with the Lord. That's what God wants to do. God wants to change lives. God wants to save souls. That's what God is doing right now. He's saving souls. He's changing lives. That's what He wants to do. This is just a building. But may we be changed in it. May we see the transformation of our community because there is the light and the glory in the heart of the people here. Amen? Amen. So, man sees the outward, but the Lord looks at the heart. So, Jesse called Abinadab and made him pass before Samuel. And he said, neither has the Lord chosen this one. Now, Jesse made Shammah pass by. And he said, neither has the Lord chosen this one. Thus, Jesse made seven of his sons pass before Samuel. But Samuel said to Jesse, the Lord has not chosen these. So Samuel, I'm sure he's at this point kind of perplexed. Seven boys have gone through. Samuel said to Jesse, are these all your children? And he said, well, uh, there is one more, but, you know, he's the youngest and very insignificant. He's, he plays the harp all the day. It's, it's, all he wants to do is sit around and play the harp and write these psalms. You, you, you're not interested in him. Get him. And he said, Behold, the youngest, he's tending the sheep. Sandy, uh, <laughs> Sandy. Samuel said to Jesse, Son, get him. We're not going to sit down until he comes. 
I love that part. We're just going to wait. We're going to wait until he shows up. So he sent and brought him in. Now, he was ruddy. It means kind of a reddish in appearance. Uh, you know, just red face, you could say. Ruddy with beautiful eyes and handsome appearance. And the Lord said, arise. Anoint him, for this is he. Can you imagine David just for a moment? You know, David's out there wa- wa- watching the sheep. And he hears this a sacrifice, but he's not invited. Because he's, you know, someone's got to watch the sheep. Uh, we're all going to the sacrifice. You stay out here because you're the youngest and you, you're, you're insignificant anyway. So you just stay out here and we're all going to go to the sacrifice. So he's out there, you know, playing his harp or writing, whatever he's doing, you know. And someone says, hey, you got to come right now. They, they're not going to sit down until you come. you got to go right now. That me? They want me to go? Right now. you got to go right now. So David, you know, goes there. And can you imagine him walking in the room? And here are all these people standing here. And there's Samuel, of all people. Samuel, right there. And he walks in, well, what's happening? Samuel walks over, and he pours oil over his head. Can you imagine the scene just for a moment? Samuel walks over, to, pours oil on his head, and whisper, I'm sure he, like, he told him, let him know. Holy Spirit immediately came upon him. Can you imagine just for a moment, David? David loved God. That was how he was known. He loved God. And so when he was told, you are anointed as the king of Israel. It's amazing. So we go back to our story. We will not sit down. Until he comes. So he sent and brought him in. Now he was ready. It says, verse 13. So Samuel took the horn of oil and anointed him in the midst of his brothers. And the Spirit of the Lord came mightily upon David from that day forward. And Samuel arose and went to Ramah. Now the Spirit of the Lord, interesting turn, immediately we're brought back to Saul. Whereas in verse 13 it says, the Spirit of the Lord came upon David mightily. It then says in verse 14, the spirit of the Lord departed from Saul and an evil spirit of the Lord terrorized him. He was troubled of soul, greatly troubled of soul. And so, but I think it's interesting, important to understand the Holy Spirit coming upon him mightily. I love that idea, the Holy Spirit coming upon him mightily. So, what I love about that is that it's exactly the same Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit has not changed. The same Holy Spirit, He who anointed David, also anointed us. And it says here that he anointed him mightily. Now, is there any word like that in the New Testament in regards to the believer? Yes. It says to the believers, every believer it says in the Scriptures, be ye filled to the full with the Holy Spirit. That's what he says to every believer. Be ye filled to the full with the Holy Spirit. The same Holy Spirit coming upon David mightily, he says of you and to me, be ye filled to the full with the Holy Spirit. Now, this is important for our understanding. For if we know that, if we believe that, we can stand on that and understand it for our own lives. You are filled to the full. Now, there is a command. There is a desire in us to be filled. Ask, seek, and ask. That there be the infilling, even the overflowing of the Holy Spirit. The scripture describes the Holy Spirit. And he says, there would be like a well within you springing up, even overflowing. That the Holy Spirit within us, with this, this life that is within us, would even be poured out to those around us. That the blessing, in other words... The Holy Spirit coming upon us would make such a difference in the lives of those around us that they would see the significance of the Holy Spirit and the power and what's happening in our lives then begins to affect their lives. And that's the Holy Spirit now beginning to move in the church, beginning to move in the community, and lives are being changed. See, this is not just a matter of everyone. No, everyone needs to buck up and be holy. Everyone needs to really buck up here and start to be holy or God's going to be upset with you. The reality is God says, look, I will be that power. 
I will be that strength, not by power, nor by might, says the Lord to his rubble, but by my spirit, says the Lord. He is the power, he is the strength of life, of change, of holiness. No man can make himself holy. No man can say, you know, I'm going to learn self-discipline. I'm going to really get self-discipline down, and I'm going to get really holy. No, you're not. It's not going to happen. But if you say, you know what I'm going to do? I'm going to love God with my heart. And I'm going to ask Him that He would fill me with His life. And I'm going to ask Him that He would fill me with His holiness. He will do it. He will do it. He'll honor your life. He'll change your life. Hunger and thirst for the greater things. I will show you a more excellent way. I'll show you a more excellent way, Paul said. And there it is. There it is. We continue. The Spirit of the Lord departed from Saul. Now, verse 15. Saul's servant said, said to him, Behold now, an evil spirit from God is terrorizing you. Let our Lord now command your servant, who, servants who are before you, let them seek a man who is a skillful player on the harp. And it shall come about when the evil spirit from God is on you that he shall play the harp with his hand and you will be well. So Saul said to his servants, Provide for me now a man who can play and bring him to me. Play well, don't forget. Then one of the young men answered and said, Behold, I've seen a son of Jesse, the Bethlehemite, who was a skillful musician, man of valor, warrior, one prudent in speech, handsome man, and the Lord is with him. Now, verse 18 is quite a description of David. So Saul sent messengers to Jesse and said, Send me your son, David, who is with the flock. Jesse took a donkey loaded with bread and a jug of wine and a young goat, sent them to Saul by David, his son. So David came to Saul. Here you see the weaving of the hand of the Lord, the sovereignty of the Lord to start to bring these lives together for his sovereign purposes. David came to Saul and attended him, and Saul loved him greatly, and he became his armor bearer. And Saul said to Jesse, saying, Let now David stand before me, for he has found favor in my sight. So it came about that whenever the evil spirit from God came to Saul, that David would take the harp, and play it with his hand. And Saul would be refreshed and be well. And the evil spirit would depart from him. Interesting thing. Here's David playing his harp beautifully. It's not just beautiful music. You know there's a difference between beautiful music and anointed music. I mean, I, I love music. And I love music of all types. I love classic Classical music. I know. I mean, I don't have a collection of classical music. I enjoy listening to it. Country and western. I can appreciate country and western. When we were growing up, my dad used to listen to country western as we were driving to pick berries. And I remember, hey, that you know, I appreciated some of that country and western music. Jazz. I enjoy jazz. But there is no music like the music which is anointed by the Holy Spirit. There is no music. I mean, I, I can listen to music that's anointed by the Holy Spirit, that honors God, and it would it, it make me want to cry. It sometimes does. Because my soul is being softened before the Lord. So when you hear what's happening in Saul, we can all say, I understand that. I get that. Because the same thing happens to me. When I get before the Lord and I worship Him and I just pour out my love to Him, He ministers to me by the Holy Spirit, something wonderful happens to me. My soul is refreshed. There's something good that goes on when the Spirit is ministering to me. You know why? Because the Scripture says that the Lord inhabits the praises of His people. So when we praise Him, the Lord is present and is blessed in it. When we bless the Lord in our heart, in our worship. It's a good thing. I think worship is a very important part of church. It's a very important part of church. I mean, studying the Word is really important, but worship is also really important because there's a, there's a ministering of the Spirit to your soul and to my soul. We need that. 
when we're, when we are studying right now the Word of God, do you know the Holy Spirit is ministering to your soul and to mine right now? As we're studying the Word of God, the Holy Spirit is ministering to your soul. He's ministering life to your soul right now in the Word. And He's ministering to my Word. And then when we worship, the Holy Spirit is ministering to your soul. The Holy Spirit is ministering to your soul and to mine. Isn't that a marvelous thought for a moment? The Holy Spirit is ministering, is healing, is touching, is, is filling, is bringing life to your soul. We're not just standing around a campground just having a fun little song. The Holy Spirit is making us into a people that love God. And that's what God wants more than anything else. Let's pray. Father, we are so thankful for your word. So thankful for the outpouring of your Holy Spirit in your word. So thankful for the outpouring of your Holy Spirit in our church and in our lives And Lord, as we read about the Holy Spirit and David coming upon him mightily, we want the Holy Spirit to come upon mightily to us as well. We need the Spirit of life. We need the Spirit of God. Lord, we don't want to just be a good people. We want to be a godly people. We want to be empowered and filled by the life which comes from the Holy Spirit. Church, as we're praying tonight, here's the heart. Here's the question. Where are you tonight with the Lord? Do you want to love Him with all of your heart? Do you want the Holy Spirit to minister to you mightily? Would you say that to Him? Would you ask that of Him? For He delights to answer that. Do you want the Holy Spirit to come upon you mightily? Do you want the things of the Lord? Seek. Paul says, I'll show you a more excellent way. Do you want these things? Ask the Lord. Just raise your hand. Ask the Lord. Lord, I want these things. I'm asking for these things. I'm asking that you would pour out that Holy Spirit mightily upon me. Bring your life. Bring the change. Bring the transformation. Because, Lord, we understand that you do these things not by might nor by power, but by the Holy Spirit. Lord, minister revival to this church. Minister change to this church. Lord, minister to us in your word and minister to us in your worship. Let the life of God be found in this place. We pray that now in Jesus' name. And everybody said, amen. Can we give the Lord praise? On behalf of Calvary Chapel Worship Center and Pastor Rich Jones, we thank you for ordering this message. Our prayer is that God will use it in your life to increase your knowledge and your love for Him. If we may serve you in any way, please contact our church office at 503-642-2003 or on our website at www.calvaryhillsboro.org. On behalf of all of us at Calvary Chapel Worship Center and Pastor Rich Jones, may God bless you.